Welcome to Sales Tax and More, your go-to resource for all things state tax related. Now, here is your host, Michael Fleming. Hello, everyone. Mike Fleming here, founder of Sales Tax and More, and today's co-host of the Sales Tax and More podcast, where we talk about everyone's favorite topic, which is, of course, sales tax. Uh, today is Monday, May 24th, 2021, and my co-host, Ellie Mop and I are going to be discussing the latest in remote seller updates. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to Ellie. Hey everyone. Hey Mike. Great to be here. Uh, I want to also do a quick introduction for Sales Tax and More before I uh, start grilling you, Mike. So um, Sales Tax and More is a full service consulting and solutions firm. We have a really great team here of experienced tax professionals who are very dedicated to fulfilling your state tax and related needs. So we do a lot of sales tax returns, sales tax registrations, uh, consulting, research, and like our name states more. So if you have questions about our services, please reach out and ask. We would love to work with you. So Mike, we have so many updates. Where do we even start? Lots and lots of updates, Ellie. There's, there's a, literally a ton of them. So why don't we get started with Florida? And Florida was one of the last three states that didn't have an economic nexus, nor did they have uh, any marketplace collection statutes in place. And as of now, Florida has implemented a $100,000 threshold. There is no transaction threshold. Um, it becomes effective on July 1st of 2021, and it's based on the previous calendar year. So if you had taxable sales last year, over $100,000, Florida is looking for you to become registered. And uh, Florida is also requiring marketplace uh, facilitators, uh, marketplaces, uh, to go ahead and collect sales tax for third-party sellers. So if you're only selling through a marketplace, you can actually deregister you know, once that marketplace starts collecting. It appears Amazon's going to be collecting as of uh, July 1st. So a lot of sellers, you know, if they're only selling through these marketplaces can deregister as of June uh, 30th. Um, if you're selling through multiple channels though, uh, and these channels are non-marketplace, for example, a Shopify, a, a big commerce, uh, a WooCommerce, you know, your own website, then you're most likely going to need to, to stay registered. Um, and for those sellers who, you know, are not selling through marketplaces, who have never had a responsibility to register in Florida before, if they're over the $100,000 last year, then they need to go ahead and get registered by uh, July 1st, start collecting and remitting the tax. Mike, this is great. I love that we're just jumping right in. Uh, so from what I understand, the local taxes have to be collected also. Oh yeah, great point, Ellie. Thanks for, for reminding me. Um, the counties in Florida are allowed to impose what's called a discretionary sales surtax. And uh, this is gonna be need, uh, this needs to be collected by all remote sellers. So not only do you have to catch, uh, collect the state rates, but you have to collect the local rates also. And by the way, in most states, um, that's what we, uh, uh, you know, when you're a remote seller, you're going to need to be collecting the local rates. Um, a lot of people, when they're trying to figure out what their past exposure is, they're only using the state rates. But in general, you need to be figuring not only the state rates, but also the local rates. So great point there, uh, Ellie. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Yeah, great point to you, Mike. And uh, other things I want to bring up here, I, I believe Kansas also passed an economic ne nexus threshold that's effective um, July 1st, 2021. Correct. Again, you're on a roll, Ellie. <laughs> um, it too uh, has a $100,000 threshold. There are no transactions, just like Florida. Um, so this one's a little different, though, where Florida was based on the previous calendar year, this one is based on the previous calendar year or the current calendar year. So 
Um, you know, the first thing you want to do is look and see if you were over a hundred thousand dollars last year. And um, if you were not, then you got to look and see if you're over a hundred thousand dollars now and through the end of the year. And then once you cross that hundred thousand dollars, or if you cross that hundred thousand dollar threshold, you'll need to be registered at that point. Um, this one's a little bit different in a couple other ways too. It's not as clear on the information and a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, number one, this wasn't, you know, signed by the governor. Uh, the governor actually vetoed it. She vetoed it actually three times, uh, two and uh, twice in 2019. Uh, because of COVID-19, they didn't even attempt it in 2020. Then she vetoed it again this year. Uh, but the legislature said enough's enough, and they overrode her. So um, they, uh, uh, we now have this $100,000 threshold, which is good because the Kansas Department of Revenue has previously said, hey, you know, we can't impose thresholds. You know, only the, you know, the politicians can do that. But we know that you don't need a physical presence in Kansas. So, you know, the Supreme Court told us that. So they started pursuing people. They said for uh, even one transaction, but then the uh, Kansas Attorney General stepped in and said, no, you have to at least follow the, uh, um, you know, the wafer guidelines, uh, which are $100,000 or 200 transactions. And the, the governor said, no, they don't. And so did the Department of Revenue. But now that the legislature has put this in place, uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. But we're, we're a little bit short of actual information on how this is going to be implemented. Uh, for now, I would go with gross sales. Um, it may be taxable sales, but like Florida, but for now, let's look at gross sales. So all sales, you know, whether they're exempt, whether they're sales for retail, I would play it on the safe side. You got to remember, Kansas is, is the state that said one transaction. So I would definitely play this on the on the state safe side. Um, as time goes on, uh, just like all the other states, more and more guidance is released. And as we get that information, we'll release it to you. Um, so uh, as of now, $100,000, uh, 200 transactions. There's also a requirement for marketplaces to collect and remit tax uh, for third-party sellers. So uh, just like uh, Florida, if you're only selling on marketplaces, now is the time that you can get deregistered. If you're selling you know, on Shopify or your own website, you're going to want to stay registered so, uh, or get registered. Uh, if you're over the $100,000. So really that just leaves Missouri as the only state with a sales tax um, that does not have an ec economic nexus or marketplace collection require requirements. Correct. Yeah. But I think that's going to change shortly because the legislature uh, sent something to the, uh, a bill to the governor's desk uh, to the best of my knowledge, the governor has not signed it, but he is expected to sign it. Um, and it also is going to be $100,000 and no transactions. So uh, that is the, the more recent trend is, is no transactions where a lot of states, you know, they just followed South Dakota, which was $100,000 and 200 or 200 transactions. But the more recent states are eliminating that transaction. Um, so... Uh, we don't have a whole lot of information on this, and this is maybe why the governor's taking his time signing it also, um, because it doesn't become effective until January 1st of 2023. So that's uh, almost 18 months out. So there's a lot of time to get a lot more information on this one. Uh, the bad news is that if you're selling uh, uh, only on a marketplace, you still have to worry about collecting the tax if you have inventory in the state of Missouri, because Amazon's not going to be collecting until uh, January of 2023. So it's still quite a bit off. Yeah, and, and Mike, I want to bring up something else. This has been really great information. These are things that we're putting out there a lot on all of our channels um, to keep people updated. But I, I want to switch gears to something else that we've been talking about here. Um, We've talked about the Pennsylvania Special Voluntary Compliance Program. 
um, for Pennsylvania. In two previous podcasts, we've had a lot of information going out about it. There's emails, there's been all kinds of updates. Do you want to share the latest information that we have? Yeah, absolutely. And the cutoff date for this was originally uh, May 8th of 2021. Uh, Pennsylvania has just come out and announced that they're extending it until June 8th of 2021. And uh, I think this is great news for any of you who have not taken advantage of this yet. Uh, give you a little bit of background. Pennsylvania is telling everybody that inventory in Pennsylvania creates nexus, not just for sales tax, but for income tax also. Um, even when the inventory is located in an Amazon warehouse and Amazon is now, you know, collecting the sales tax, there's still an income tax responsibility there. And, you know, the first group of people that got these letters were, you know, Amazon sellers, FBA sellers, people who have inventory in the state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is telling you, we know who you are. Uh, this is a great voluntary compliance program. Um, it's only got a two uh, year look back, two years and change at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, we're only going back to January 1st of 2019. So if you're only selling on Amazon, you don't have to worry about sales tax because Amazon's been collecting the sales tax for longer than that. But you do have to worry about the income tax. Um, and they're serious. Um, so, um, you know, they're also worried about income tax. You know, some people are selling on, say, an Amazon and the Shopify. Well, the Shopify is not a marketplace. And even if you're under Pennsylvania's $100,000 threshold, what they're saying is physical presence overrides economic nexus. And if you have inventory in the state of Pennsylvania, then that overrides the economic nexus. And you still have to register to collect the sales tax on the Shopify's on your own website, uh, as well as paying the income tax. Um, anyone who's gotten this letter who doesn't take advantage of this program, I, I just think that's silly. They are going to come after you. There's no questions about it. We've had conversations with the state and they're really gonna be stepping it up. They're really gonna be getting aggressive. And, uh, but it's not just for people who got the letter. I mean, this is for anyone. If you have inventory in Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania's taking this to the next level. So you might as well go ahead and take advantage of this program. I mean, who wants a state coming back after you seven, eight years if you've been doing you know, business uh, in that state for, for that long and have had inventory in the state for that long? So. Uh, a year and change when we're talking about uh, income tax, two years and change when we're talking about sales tax. So uh, I definitely recommend taking advantage of this program if you have uh, inventory in the state of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Mike. And um, I know we I know we want to talk about some other tough states, but before we go over what a um, but before we do, can we go over what is a per prospective registration? We can, but I want to circle back to Pennsylvania again one more time. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people say that, well, we're a foreign company. We're not subject to the taxes in the U.S. Well, you're not subject to the federal tax because there's a tax treaty in between the U.S. and most countries. Not all countries, but uh, many countries. So people don't have to worry, you know, if they're a foreign corporation, they don't have to worry about, or a foreign owned corporation, uh, they don't have to worry about the income tax here. Now, states are sovereign. Each one of the states is like their own little country in the US, and they are not a party to the tax treaty. Now, most of them do follow, you know, out of courtesy, the pr provisions of the tax treaty, but there are 13 states that do not adhere to the tax treaty. And Pennsylvania is one of those states. So they're going to pursue um, foreign sellers also. And a lot of foreign sellers say, well, how are they going to get me? Well, they told us how they're going to get you. They have uh, set up reciprocity agreements with a lot of the states where there are ports. So as something comes in to the ports, they're going to be there looking to impound uh, the, the inventory. So that's number one. 
um, and expect more states to start doing this also. Number two, there are a whole bunch of warehouses in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so if you've got inventory at Amazon, there's a great chance it's going to be in one or more of those warehouses in Pennsylvania. They are going to go after that. And then they're going to go after your account receivables at these uh, marketplaces. You know, everyone's got money at, uh, you know, Amazon. You know, you don't get, it's not instantaneous. Usually it's, it's sent out to you every week or every other week. Um, and just like the, the rest of the uh, platforms. So uh, Pennsylvania plans on going after those uh, monies. All right, so now do we want to go? I'm sorry to throw off this, uh, this nope. great flow that we're on. No, don't be sorry at all. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go over what pr prospective res registration is for everyone. If I can say it, that is. <laughs> all right. Um, prospective registration is when you use a current date uh, a current start date in order to get registered. For example, if you were to go to get registered in Florida now because of economic nexus, you would generally use a 7-1 start date. So that's perspective that's going forward. Um, same thing in Kansas, you're going to use a perspective date. Um, but let's say you have some other type of nexus or you're just figuring out, you know, they say that six out of 10 or one out of two in a, in a different survey, uh, companies are not compliant when it comes to economic nexus. So maybe you have exposure from three years ago. And the states want you to use the date that your nexus actually began. So uh, you would use you know, a date from two years ago or three years ago. So we call that a historic registration when you're going backwards. And that's the way that the states want you to do it if you have past exposure. But a lot of people, you know, even when they're, you know, have nexus going backwards, instead of using a historic registration, they decide that they want to register prospectively for multiple reasons. Either they don't know that you're supposed to go backwards, or they didn't realize they had nexus, or uh, they don't have the money to go backwards and take care of it. And they just want to stop the bleeding today. And they realize that past exposure is still open, but they just want to stop the bleeding today. So it doesn't keep, you know, getting bigger and bigger. Um, or they don't have the mindset and they say, no one ever told me about this. So I'm not going to pay it out of my own pocket. Um, so that's, uh, those are some of the reasons why people would register going forward when they should, according to the states, register going back to the date that the nexus began. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much for going over that. And um, Meg, I, I, we talked about a number of states cracking down on this. Do, do you want to share? Yeah, uh, Illinois is the latest state. And you never know who's going to become the, the newest state to start cracking down on this. Uh, we started talking about this, uh, you know, 60 days or so ago. Uh, we saw a couple of clients, a couple of potential clients whom the state had sent letters to and saying, we're now going to audit you. Uh, one of them, actually, they had been registered since uh, January of 2019. The state went after them for three months because uh, the economic nexus began in October of 2018. Um, we're now seeing a bunch of it. And at this point, uh, we're telling, you know, all of our clients, don't try to get registered prospectively. I, I know that, you know, uh, a lot of you uh, really can't, you know, pay the back taxes. You got to figure out a way that you're going to do it. Um, you got to look at doing a VDA or doing some type of historical registration with a, uh, with some type of uh, penalty waiver you know, request that. A lot of times you'll get it, even if it's not a BDA. But you don't want to be audited and then go back and say, okay, you all, all of these months were the back tax plus penalty and interest and not be prepared for that. A lot of times if they find you, they're not going to allow the BDA. A lot of times they're not going to allow any sort of penalty waiver. Um, so that can be an issue. And that exposure never goes away. It always stays open because you weren't registered. You didn't file a return. So the statute, you know, never ends. So three years from now, you think that you're good because the statute of limitations is three or four years. Um, 
but they find out, you know, that that three year period prior to the date you got registered, you weren't registered, you weren't filing returns, they can go back and still pick up those three years. So um, <clears throat> we, you know, are telling all of our clients that we're doing registrations for, you, you can't register prospectively or you don't want to register prospectively in Illinois. I just would not change it. There's entirely too much risk there. Um, you know, Maine started this off. Um, they let everyone get registered. Then they went back and audited. And they're still in the process of auditing companies that, um, you know, did not go back and, and prove that they did not have Nexus as of July 1st of 2018, which is when their uh, uh, economic nexus came into play. So that's almost three full years of back taxes. Um, South Dakota, they don't even let you register. They stop you during the registration process. Uh, so that's another tough, tough state. So Illinois, Maine, South Dakota, absolutely the three toughest states out there when it comes to trying to register prospectively. Uh, we've seen Wisconsin and Massachusetts start asking a lot of questions, but as of now, they're just asking questions. I don't know of anybody, either our clients or uh, anybody out there. You know, I talk to a lot of people. Um, I haven't heard of any audits yet in either of those states, but I'm getting pretty nervous at the amount of questions that are being asked. And, you know, we never know who's going to be the next aggressive state but I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of these two states. Yeah, I think we got everyone uh, nice and nervous here, Mike. So um, I've heard that Maryland is actually doing something nice. Is that true? Can we cheer everyone up? Yeah, if you're registered in Maryland, uh, it's actually a really good thing they're doing. I think they've done it by mistake or at least partially by mistake. But hey, we'll take our wins wherever we can get it. So I say this was partially by mistake because a lot of states out there are saying, okay, the businesses in our state, people who are brick and mortar, for example, our restaurants, our bars, our, um, you know, gyms, um, you know, anybody that got really hurt by the COVID-19 closures, we want to do something nice for them. So we're seeing that in a lot of states. Maryland is saying the same thing, and they're talking about Maryland businesses. And when I hear that type of language, I'm not usually considering someone located in Texas and selling remotely into the state of Maryland. I, I don't think of that as a Maryland business. I think of that as a Texas business that's doing some business in Maryland. You know, they're not generating jobs in, in Maryland. Um, you know, they're not voting people in or out of office. I mean, there's not really, uh, and actually they're taking business away from some of the Maryland businesses. So you generally don't want to reward people from another state, but that's what's happening. So not only the Maryland businesses that are physically located in Maryland, but everybody who's selling into Maryland is being rewarded um, or being compensated uh, or being helped out, however you want to say it, because of, you know, the uh, tough business uh, climate out there uh, and people trying to make up losses from COVID-19. So what they're doing is giving credits for up to $3,000 per month. And it's for the months of March, April, and May uh, for returns due in April, May, June, or July. I mean, July is where some of these quarterly returns uh, would be due. So, um, you know, it all depends. Uh, it, it's got to be for the months of March, April, or May, and then depending when those returns were due. Now, um, here's one of the problems. They didn't make this available until May 17th. April returns were due in March. Well, what good is that if you're in, in uh, May 17th? Uh, May returns uh, were due by the 20th. Most people get them done a day or two early. So it didn't really help out for the month of May. It will help out for the month of June. So in order to get um, this money, you got to go back and amend the returns. And that's what we're going to be doing for our clients. Um, but the, the, the big thing here is um, you can't have more than $6,000 collected 
in one of those periods. So if you have $6,100, you're not eligible for one of these credits. Um, and the credit is $3,000 or the actual amount of the tax collected if it's less than that. So let's say that you collect exactly $6,000 worth of tax. Well, the max that they're going to credit you is $3,000. If you only collected $500 worth of tax, then you're only going to get the $500. Um, if you collect any more than $6,000, you're just not eligible for the program. So this is a really good thing. And whether they did it by accident, uh, you know, when they whether or not they wanted to include everybody who sells into the state of Maryland, uh, this is a pretty nice uh, thing. I mean, uh, you could get up to $9,000 back. Ian, that's nothing to sneeze at. All right, Mike, lots of great information today. Is there anything else you want to touch base on? Yeah, there's two things. Um, the first thing, uh, states are getting aggressive again. I mean, during the, the pandemic shutdown, um, and some states are just opening back up, they were pretty nice to, to, to taxpayers. Um, prior to the shutdown, they were starting to go after com uh, companies because they know that either one out of two or six out of 10, depending on which survey you're looking at, uh, they know a lot of people are not compliant for economic nexus. So they had already started gearing up to go after these companies. And then you have this recession. Uh, so this is really like the perfect storm because whenever you're coming out of a recession, we see increased auditing, we see increased discovery efforts, we see uh, increased collection efforts. So you have these two big, huge events coming together and um, we're going to start seeing the states get a whole lot more aggressive. And once the state contacts you, your options are limited. You're, you're being reactive. Um, and, you know, the ability to mitigate some of this past exposure is, is off the table. Um, whereas if you're being proactive, uh, you still have some options to mitigate some of this past exposure. Um, so we know the states are coming. They're going to be making examples of people. Do not procrastinate. Be proactive. Um, at this point, you know, economic nexus is a thing. It's not going away. Um, and while they're looking for economic nexus, they're going to find all other types of nexus. So I urge everyone to be proactive. Uh, don't wait till the state finds you. Go ahead and start becoming compliant. Uh, that's number one. Uh, the second thing, just thanks for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you. We hope that uh, you, you've enjoyed our presentation and uh, we look forward to seeing you, hearing you, uh, being with you uh, at future episodes of the Sales Tax and More podcast. Yeah, and uh, I'll close out here too by just saying, uh, if you have any questions about our services, if you'd like to know more about what we do, if you'd like access to more information, just reach out to me directly at emoffat, E-M-O-F-F-A-T, at salestaxandmore.com. You can also go right to our website, salestaxandmore.com. Um, in addition to the services we offer, we do have an entire series of free webinars that provide CPE credit. We have paid resources on our site as well, and we would love to uh, help you explore all of those options. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe and check out all of the resources we have out on the web 